on this check, is there anything on that check that says payment in full? Uh, no. Does it, anywhere on that check, does it say uh, satisfaction and accord? No. In fact, purpose is left blank, is it not? Uh -huh. Every check I write, I leave the, the purpose blank. I'm just going to publish this check to the jury if you don't mind. And that's the end of this uh, witness, the testimony of this witness, Rich Robinson. Let's turn to Lisa Davis, trial attorney and partner in a law firm here in New York, specializing in all aspects of entertainment law, contract disputes, intellectual property, and emphasis is on music and motion pictures. So it, it appears, does it not, that we have been dwelling on the inelegant period of time that they formed this partnership, and in the past couple minutes, that it was just as clumsy in whatever efforts they made to dissolve it. That's correct. Um, the, um, the attorney for the plaintiff just raised the issue of did the check say accord and satisfaction, which is something that you write on a check to say this is in full settlement of a claim. Um, the um, band member, didn't, Rich Robinson, didn't do that. Um, so it's not clear what the intention was. But by the same token, Jennings accepted that check and didn't put any notation on the check saying, you know, accepted under protest, anything like that, mm -hmm. saying this is not a full settlement of the claim. So but it comes from Rich Robinson. It, it doesn't say Black Crows on it. It, it doesn't uh, come from the other members of the group. Uh, so it's, what, ambiguous at best? Definitely it's ambiguous. I mean, the, where the money comes from to settle a claim, it doesn't necessarily have to come from a joint bank account, let's say. If there's an agreement as to an amount of money to settle a claim, and that amount comes from, say, one band member as opposed to all, of all five of them, that doesn't really matter. Okay. Lisa Davis, I want to thank you. I've enjoyed being with you. This is your first visit on Court TV, and it continues. I leave and make room for my colleague, Carol Randolph, as we continue with this uh, very uh, compelling and interesting case uh, of Jennings versus the Black Crows. So Chris Gordon saying so long for now. Stay tuned. Carol Randolph will be here in just a few moments. I'm Carol Randolph, along with guest commentator Lisa Davis, a partner in a New York law firm that specializes in all aspects of entertainment law. Well, what constitutes a partnership? In Georgia, it can be an implied or express contract as long as there is a meeting of the minds between the parties. In the case presently underway, there apparently is no meeting of the minds between plaintiff Kevin Jennings and the defendants, members of the Black Crow Rock and Roll Band, although Jennings maintains a partnership does exist between the parties. And he claims his partnership was memorialized on paper in a pie-shaped drawing divided into six parts, representing each party's one-sixth share in the profits generated by the band. The Black Crows band members claim the pie-shaped drawing was done in jest, that no partnership ever existed, nor was there any intent to form one, which including Jen Jennings. And further, he has been paid for all services rendered. It is therefore up to a Georgia jury to determine if a partnership ever existed. And if they so rule, then the trial will move into a second phase, an accounting stage, to decide what monies, if any, would be due plaintiff Kevin Jennings. Now, earlier in the trial, band member and lead singer Chris Robinson testified that the signature on the pie-shaped drawing was not his. And here, witness Brian Byrne Carney, a forensics document examiner, testifies what he discovered when he examined the signature on the pie-shaped chart. Let's go back into the courtroom. During my examination of this particular document and this particular signature, the first thing that struck me as significant was when I looked at the Robinson portion of the name, I found that there was no capital letter R and lowercase o in the surname Robinson represented in the question signature. When I looked through the known signatures for comparative purposes, I found that Christopher Robinson did in fact sometimes omit the letter O, as shown here on line K110 and others, but he never omitted both the capital letter R and the lowercase O in the surname Robinson. That was the first, first thing that I found of significant difference. The next thing I found was looking at the signature that it appeared to be rather lifeless. In other words, there was an absence, if you will, of rhythmic pin pressure, pin variation uh, throughout the, 
the writing of the given in the surname. If you look in the known writings on lines K1 through K110, and even on this particular signature on Defendant's Exhibit 35, you'll see that the upper extenders and some of the internal letters show a variation in pen pressure, a lightness and a darkness, if you will. After I discovered those two things, I used some magnification and got close to the, to the lowercase h in the given name Chris. And I found, and so demonstrated for you via photomicrographs, that we had pin stops, two of them to be exact, and I point back to the Q, to the red letter Q1 area, it is this segment of the H, which is the descending stroke and connecting stroke to presumably the next letter form in the given name Chris, which would be R. That's where the, the enlargements are in terms of the photomicrographs. That's a segment of the line that you're looking at. And these simply demonstrate to you that the pen has stopped moving right in the middle of the writing line. This type of feature is characteristic of what we call a simulation in a writing. In other words, it's a drawing. If you want to mimic someone's signature, you will have a model signature, for example, a known signature, and then you will effectively draw it on another piece of paper. This causes several things to occur. One, you don't have any pin pressure variation. Two, oftentimes you have to stop in the writing line to see where to go to next because you're looking from one to the other. And these are the types of characteristics that I found here. In addition to this, when I examined the given name portion of the signature, which purports to be Chris or Christopher, I found that there was a series of waves, if you will, that's the pictorial idea that you get when you look at the name Chris, peaked mounds, if you will, and I found that they were more or less equidistant and very regular. And I compared that to that segment of the signature in the known signatures of Christopher Robinson. What I found was, although Christopher Robin Robinson, for example, here on line K14 on Defendants 33, when he makes the crisp portion of the signature, the series of mounds vary in height, up and down in space, left and right. If you look back to the question signature, you'll simply see that this is very even, very evenly spaced. He doesn't do that. That's a misinterpretation on whoever the writer of this signature is. The last thing of real significance that I found was in the B, lowercase b letter, in Benson, if you will. This particular letter form is what we call, as document examiners, letter form misinterpretation. And by that, I simply mean that the stroke itself is formed, reversed from the way Christopher Robinson really does it. Follow my pointer, if you will, pointing here to line Q1 in the question signature. Under microscope, you can tell that this stroke begins approximately here. It travels in a diagonal <coughs> manner towards one o'clock on the face of a clock, makes a counterclockwise movement, closing the loop, descends angularly to the baseline of writing, which is what we call the ruled or imaginary line, and then ascends again back to the point just under where it started before it begins its movement into a bowl shape here, which is part of the connecting stroke to the next letter form. If you look at any one of the B formation, K1, K2, K3, K4, K5, K9, K10, and even on the single signature, you'll find that that formation does not resemble what's going on here in the question document. It's an opposite writing movement in here. This is more, in the question signature, it's more of a figure eight movement. And the stroke, as it comes up the back of the B, actually then goes into the bowl formation, the connecting stroke. If you look, for example, on K11 and look at the lower portion of the B, you'll see it's a single stroke that descends to the baseline, goes diagonally to the right, and then into the next letter form. These are opposite writing movements. That's what we call letter form misinterpretation. The writer is not sure of the sequence of strokes 
probably based on the model that he or she had at, at that time. What's interesting about this testimony that is on cross-examination, this witness would, said he could not say anything about the X on the pie chart itself, whether or not Chris Robinson had done that, even though there's been some testimony that he did put this X on the cross on the pie shape chart, as well as the fact that he said there are often occasions when someone can alter their handwriting to the extent that no one could really tell whether or not it was a person's handwriting, which I thought was very interesting. I thought they were always give little giveaway, giveaways that you would pick up on this. But Lisa, let's talk about what if. Let's follow along on the defense's position. Chris Robinson didn't sign the contract. What's the ramification of all of that? Well, if he didn't sign the contract, if you have a, a partnership situation, all of the partners have to agree um, to add a new member to the partnership. So if he didn't sign, um, or if the jury finds that they can't, you know, establish that he did sign it, then there wasn't a partnership established with Kevin Jennings becoming a member. Now, what does that X do, if anything at all? If a person can essentially write their name but chooses to put an X down there and everybody who sees it says he was the person who did the X, do you have any conflict because as that whatever you want to call that as opposed and then another signature well there there were cases i remember from law school there are contract cases where somebody signing an x if it can be proved that that person did put their x there and did intend for that to be their mark then that that's held a binding signature on a contract i mean here you have somebody who's clearly literate so it's not a situation where someone is illiterate but that's really it's a it's a question of fact for the jury to determine whether or not he intended by putting an x there to bind himself to this agreement or not. Well, that's an interesting point then, because you've heard some testimony say that they saw him put this X there. Now he's saying, I didn't sign the other sheet, you know, my signature is not mine. How do you determine then what the person's intent might be? One person who has a vested interest in all of this says he did sign, and then you have this other in indication going on. I think what you have to do is you have to look at the circumstances surrounding, you know, this pie chart being drawn up and being signed by the different band members. You have to find out factually what were they all thinking, what were their intentions, and you just have to really try to draw it out and determine whether they intended for this to be a souvenir as they're contending or whether they intended it to be a partnership agreement and just something informal that would then be formalized at a later date. We want to pick up that point a little bit later on too but we're going to take a break now when we come back you'll hear the testimony from Mr. Whitley who happened to be the band manager at that time. We'll be right back with more. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give today to be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Give your testimony towards the mic. And Mr. Raglan, the month and the trial of uh, Jennings versus Black Crow's band. This is Mr. Jennings says that he was at one time uh, had a partnership agreement with the band, and that he is entitled to one sixth of the profits that were generated from the album Shake Your Money Maker. Well, we're going to hear from the man who was one of the managers at that time. He is the next witness in this case, Patrick Whitley, and he at the time, along with Mr. Angeles, were the, were together in managing the group when they made this or uh, released this uh, record-making uh, album. I think it generated about five million in sales. Let's go in and see what he has to say about Mr. Jennings, and he indicates that, as far as he was concerned, he just happened to be a friend and a fan, nothing more. Did Kevin Jennings uh, come to the gathering at the Ritz-Carlton after the show? Yes, he did. At that time, what did you understand Kevin Jennings' relationship with the band to be? I understood he was, he was a friend of the band's. Did you understand that he was the manager of the band? No. No. Absolutely not. What happened next in the development of your relationship with the Black Rose? We, within that 24-hour period, are you talking about months and weeks? Well, let's say until the end of 1989. That was uh, till the end of 89, which wasn't very much time. There were discussions, my memory's a little foggy of, of that time period, but discussions on the phone uh, after we'd, we'd gone back to Los Angeles. We liked what we'd seen, we, we liked the guys, and we, we had discussions about working with them as managers, and that would have been what would have gone on to the end of the year. And we'd also would have been talking to the record company to see exactly what was going on with their record release and everything else that was going on. 
Did you and Mr. Angelus submit uh, written management contracts for the van's consideration? At some point within that time period, late 89, 1st of January, we would have submitted some sort of rough deal memo to define pretty much what the relationship would have been. Uh, and that was something that we wanted to have in place because as managers, you tend to sort of move forward in a major way and uh, work to make their career start from from that point. So you, you call in a lot of favors and, and you want to make sure that they want to work you, with you and we're all in agreement over the terms of the agreement. So there'd have been some sort of deal memo there. And then a, a long form agreement, uh, which I seem to remember was signed in, in early February. So that would have to be in place with them a couple, three weeks before so they could have looked at it. So that would have been what would have happened. With respect to the terms of the management agreement between uh, you and Mr. Angelus in the band, on the other hand, did Kevin Jennings have any role in the negotiation of the terms of that agreement? No. Who from the band was negotiating with you and Mr. Angelus regarding the terms of your management agreement? It was predominantly Chris and Rich Robinson. Do you know if the Black Crows had a lawyer? They, I seem to remember they did. Did the lawyer negotiate on their behalf? He was involved with them. Did Kevin Jennings sign the management contract with you and Mr. Angelus? No. Why not? I wouldn't even have expected him to. He was, he was a friend of the band's, and when we when we signed up or when we signed an agreement with the band to manage them, we had the band sign, and they signed. And there was nobody else, as far as we was concerned, involved at all. Did any member of the band ever tell you that Kevin Jennings was going to be a partner with the musicians in the band? No, never. Did any member of the band ever tell you that Kevin Jennings was going to receive an equal share of the profits of the band? No. Did any member of the band ever tell you that Kevin Jennings was going to get the same deal that he had with the Georgia Satellites Band? No. At that time, did you even know what Kevin Jennings' deal was with the Georgia Satellites? I haven't a clue. Did you know that he was associated in any way with the Georgia Satellites? I think so. I think I remember that, that somewhere within a discussion of, of meeting the band and meeting Kevin, something had come up that he, he used to or did work with the Georgia Satellites. Did you know exactly what his role was with the Georgia Satellites? I think I remember that he was their tour manager. Did you know that he was an equal partner with the musicians in the Georgia Satellites band at that time? No. Are you familiar with uh, industry standards regarding the financial arrangements between uh, band members? Uh, yes, in, in a sense of well, let me every ask you band this. has a different situation. Let me ask you this. Is it customary in the music industry for a tour manager uh, who had nothing to do with getting a band recording contract to be treated as an equal partner no. with the musicians that's, in the band? No, that's not customary at all. And that is, again, one of the co-managers of the band at around the time that album that came out, Shake Your Money Maker, as we said, five million copies were sold. Joining us now is Jane Okrasinski. Jane was down there as a reporter, and she's a producer on this uh, trial. And welcome back, Jane. I've been watching you throughout the day. You're joining Lisa Davis, who is also a partner in, in an entertainment law firm here. Let's just talk about a couple of things here. The management agreement now. He's not on there, but would he be on there? That's right. That's right. And the point is made during this, this case that, and again, his relationship with the satellites is critical here because he contends that the deal the band, the Black Crows offered him was the same arrangement you had with the satellites. And his arrangement with the satellites was admittedly an unusual one. He did serve primarily as their tour manager during the period of time in which he shared in the band's profits very unusual arrangement. On the other hand, he did have a share of the profits. He didn't sign their management contract either, or their record contract, or anything else. But a handshake agreement with this other band that he says the Crows knew about, 
and extended the same offer but to he him. did a lot more with that Georgia satellite thing. I mean he really babied them and really restructured and put them in uh, together but that, he didn't seem to do the same thing with black crow well it's certainly true at the time he met the black crows the crows were further along in their careers although they had not yet sold a single record they had not yet been on tour they weren't even covering their expenses with the concerts that or the gigs that they played in clubs around the southeast they had recorded their album and they did have a record contract now they were trying to get that record out the plaintiff's contention is they wanted him to leave the satellites to come help them over the hump into the big time. Their contention is, no, they did it all themselves. He had nothing to do with any of it, and he was just another friend of the band. Mm, he gave up quite a bit to be just another friend of the band. But Lisa, this points up to me, wow, even the very fledgling groups ought to be talking to an attorney or someone early on in the, in the game. Even though they think they're friends for life, this are relatives, this will never happen to us, we're splitting 50-50, someone needs to get in there and just kind of put down on paper what's going on within the parties. Absolutely. I mean, because money changes everything. And while it may sound self-serving to say, you know, you should have an attorney very early on. The minute you're thinking about signing any kind of piece of paper, whether it's a pie chart like this one or whether it's a more formal contract, you really do need to have an attorney so that you understand, so that both parties understand what they're agreeing to and what the arrangement will be in the case of success or in the case of failure. Well, now, there is also, as I remember, one of these weak cases in contract law, but this, when you have done something that's to your detriment, relying on whatever it is, that a promise or something that was made to you by another group. Now, if they promised him something and he gives up something that is a known lucrative arrangement, how does that stand? And if we're trying to figure out what's going on in terms of the, whether or not a partnership or a contract existed. Well, it certainly meets the requirement of consideration, and that is one of the questions here. The defendant's position is that Kevin Jennings did some things for them before this January 2nd agreement, alleged agreement, they don't admit the agreement, but that he had done some things for, for them before January 2nd. That can't be consideration for the alleged contract, because past services cannot be the consideration. So you have to look at January 2nd and forward for what the consideration was. They said all that happened after January 2nd was he helped us move the equipment to the album release party, and then he became a dad and disappeared from our lives. So there was no consideration. Kevin Jennings says, but wait a minute, I also went and had that meeting with Dan Baird where I told him I was leaving the satellites because you all had offered me the same deal. So it may well be the, the linchpin of the consideration argument from the plaintiff's standpoint. Well, this is really, you, you, you think about it again, it goes back to put it out on paper, but then even putting it on paper, we don't know what the parties intended. Well, and it's also particularly difficult in a situation like this where you have people at such a profound moment of change in their lives. You have this band that has had nothing really in the way of success, but has a lot of promise. And then three weeks later, that promise starts being fulfilled. So you're right at a time where they were doing everything on the basis of oral agreements virtually. There was no money to pay anybody mm -hmm. to do anything to a point where within a very short period of time they had professional management, everything was in writing, everything became much more formal, you know, and that's, that makes it particularly difficult to know which way were they operating on this particular day? Was it the, the business band, successful band, or was it the informal guys sitting around a table with lots of hopes and dreams and not much of anything else? Timing is everything. That's certainly true. I don't know, I, I kind of disagree with you a little bit because I feel that even though um, they were maybe you know at a crossroads in their career, we have artists coming in before they even have a record contract and having formal agreements signed. When you have a situation like this where they've already got a record in the can and it's about to come out, I would argue that they would not be doing something this important without it being a more formalized situation. And of course that's the defendants, one of the defendants big points, that they knew how to do things formally, they did a formal record contract and very shortly after this they entered into a formal management agreement with Whitley and Angeles. Therefore, 
this can't have been the good a contract. That pie chart is nothing more than, what is it, symbolic, heavy symbolism and jest. Well, let's see. Let's go back into the courtroom for the cross-examination of Mr. Whitley. Again, there it goes back into whether or not Chris Robinson introduced Jennings, and he tries to bring that out. How was Jennings introduced to this man? Whether or not he was introduced as just one of the fans or, or one of us us being a very important word there because it seems to indicate an entity there that if it is that's true that entity may be the partnership and then therefore mr jennings may be entitled to that one sixth of the profits from that album let's go back into the courtroom and do you recall uh chris robinson at that uh at that function introducing kevin jennings as uh as one of us to you and peter angelis no, I don't recall that. Uh, do you recall uh, saying in response uh, when you were told what Kevin Jennings' role was with the band, that every band needs a man like Kevin Jennings? I don't remember at that point being told what his role with the band was. We were just, he was a friend of the band. He was the person who we'd understood was, was in charge of their equipment, and we'd met at the Cotton Club. And he was a friend of the band, so that's what we looked at to him as. Okay, was he ever described as a babysitter for the band, taking care of everything? I don't think so. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, I, I did not hear that last answer. I don't remember him being described as a babysitter. He could have been described as a babysitter, but you don't remember? Could have been, yes, okay. I don't remember. How many meetings do you recall with Kevin Jennings in 1989 and 1990, where he was present, any meetings where he was present? That was the only time I remember him being present when we met the band and uh, got together. And at the Ritz-Carlton? The, it would be at the club. We met him very briefly, and I just remember meeting him, and then he, he introduced us. He took us up to the dressing room, and we met the band. So that was a very, very brief uh, meeting with him. And then at the hotel, he was, he was there when we were getting together after the show, and that was it. Do you recall a video shoot in December uh, that same month uh, with the Black Crows band? I don't recall that at some point they shot a video. I don't know whether that had been done before or after that meeting. I don't remember that. Okay. Were, were you present at that video shoot? No. Did, uh, did you ever call the band at Kevin Jennings' house or ever send faxes to Kevin Jennings' house? I may have. Did you? Did you remember sending faxes of the proposed management agreement uh, with the Black Crows to Kevin Jennings' house? I don't remember. Uh, I don't recall whether it was sent there. It would more than likely have been sent to their attorney than direct to the group. Is it possible you did send some copies to, to Kevin Jennings' house? It's possible. And uh, do you recall uh, shipping uh, guitar cases to Kevin Jennings' house? around the time of this album release party? Not exactly. No, I don't remember exactly. Okay, Might have happened. Let me ask you, uh, did you recall sending the band guitar cases? I have a memory at that point that we, we did <clears throat> purchase some guitars, so they, in a logical sense, would have been shipped there. To Kevin Jennings' house? Yes. And that's, again, Kevin Jennings says, I've been playing a very major role in the lives of the Black Crows band, and I should be entitled to be considered as a partner. There have been many reasons to consider me as one, including a pie chart drawing showing that all parties would have one-sixth of a share of the profits. We'll take a break. We'll come back, and we'll have testimony from another band member, Steve Gorman.
have any ideas at all of doing something in the entertainment area, you may want to pay close attention to what's going on. But if anything, you'll learn that it's important to really get your agreement between the parties down on paper. Make sure that all the parties understand exactly what it is that they're agreeing to, which may or may not have been the case that we're showing you presently that took place in Georgia. That's of Kevin Je Jennings, and it's against the Black uh, Crow rock and roll band. Jennings says that there was a partnership agreement between the parties, that it started off as an oral agreement where all parties shook hands on that, was in get, again memorialized in the form of a pie chart, at least the symbolism of that oral agreement. And now he wants to get his one-sixth share of any profits generated from an album that the Crows released in 1990. They indicated that, unfortunately, there was no uh, agreement. Yet, yes, Mr. Jennings has done a lot of work with them, for them, but he was paid for his services. But now as we're into the, to the defense's case, Steve Gorman, who was a band member, takes a stand, and he's asked about the relationship between the band members and Jennings. Let's see what he has to say. Did uh, there come a time that uh, Kevin actually heard you rehearse live at his house? Yes, there was. Uh, what did Kevin say or do after he, he heard you play live? We played, we were rehearsing, and... Uh, Kevin told us after hearing us one time that he loved the band. He said, you know, he was very excited. He said, you guys can rehearse here for free forever. That's it. I'm, I can't charge you. It's just too good. He's, I mean, very graciously, you know, this guy was a, a big fan. And he said, he was, Kevin was the first person that ever said to me, I'm a fan of the band. I mean, the word fan. And I thought, man, this guy really likes the band. I mean, and he made that offer and we accepted uh, and thereafter, did you hang out uh, at Kevin's house? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, did Kevin help the band in the fall of 1989? Yes, he did. What kinds of things did Kevin do? Um, well, he, he gave us our rehearsal space and storage space. That was, that was the biggest thing initially at the time. Um, as, as the fall moved on, we had a few shows booked already, and he helped us get to those shows. You know, he, he helped with equipment. We used his car. I mean, he drove his car, let us pack it full of equipment. Um, he went on, a, took on a few trips with us out of town. And like everybody said, you know, he actually popped for a couple of hotel rooms on different times and paid for the gas and offered support, you know, in a lot of ways. Just did everything that everyone's been talking about for the last few days. I don't want to go, I mean, I don't know how much I have to go over, but he, no, did, a, he no. did a good deal for us. We were really, we spent a lot of time with him. Did Kevin become a good friend of yours? Mm -hmm. I'd say so. Uh, how did the relationship that uh, you all had with Kevin change, if it did, in uh, December of 1989 when the band started talking about uh, uh, signing up professional management. Um, that, that would have been when when we we had been talking about professional management through the fall uh, with George Draculius. That was something we wanted to you know that was just the point of this time. Let's find management. After a while, it became very much the focal point. Once that got closer to you know becoming to coming to its fruition, however you want to say, you know once that was about to become a reality. And then especially when we had made the decision with Pete and Pat that Pete and Patrick were probably going to be the guys, uh, Kevin became very concerned uh, and worried about what would, what would happen in the future. He started discussing to me uh, that he, he was unsure of the future. I, he, he would make very unclear statements about, you know, this is going to happen, it's going to be great, but, you know, the management, you never know who you can really trust. He made a lot of comments about management, and he viewed them as a necessary evil. Something you have to have, you got to watch their back. And that didn't go along with the way I thought. I mean, to me, you know, you sign up with management, you work together. I mean, that's just the way we wanted it to be. So we had a lot of discussions about his views on management, and, and then in particular started going towards his view on what would happen to him once we got management. And did you and he talk about that subject, about what would happen to Kevin once you got professional management? We talked about it, yes. Yes, he, I was, uh, I had a sympathetic ear, I think, and Kevin felt he could talk to me about these kind of things. 
Uh, and the fact that you were a drummer and he played around a little bit with the drums. Too. Yeah, I, th I think that, that might have initially been a case, but he just, we spoke about things, and I think he thought he, I was someone he could talk to. Did uh, Kevin mention to you that he wanted to be tour manager with the with We, uh, we just, yeah, we, we discussed that. Uh, I was all for that idea. Of, of the people that we knew, Kevin had experience in that capacity, and I thought that would be a great idea. When was it that the band decided to hire Pete Angelus as uh, the professional management for the band? Um, shortly after Christmas, we met Pete and Patrick just before Christmas. Uh, I left town for the holidays, and I know that when I, when I came back, I was talking with Chris on the phone, and he said he'd fill me in on what had gone on in my absence and said, you know, Pete's, Pete's the guy. He's really, of everyone we met, he's great. So it was before, it was the week between Christmas and New Year's when I first heard at least Chris say, in my opinion, Pete's going to be the man. That's, that's what I want to see happen. When did you get back from uh, being out of town over the holiday? Uh, it would have been the 27th or 28th. Then that, I mean, when I got home and that was the first thing that was addressed, I mean, when I, when I got back. Uh, had the band, uh, did everybody in the band then decide that you were, in fact, going to go with uh, Pete Angels? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first time everyone got together, I mean, it was just a, it was decided and concluded that was the decision. Was that on January the 2nd or was it before January the 2nd? It, that was before January 2nd. Now, did, uh, back in the fall of 1989, when the band was talking about uh, professional management, did Kevin Jennings ever offer his comments about whether he wanted to be considered as the manager of the Black Crows band. Yes, he did. What did he say in that regard? He, he offered his services on several occasions. His, his comment was always, I'd like to throw my hat in the ring. And he offered that on a number of, number of occasions. Did you understand him to be saying that he wanted the band to consider him to be the personal manager or the professional manager of the band? Yes, that's what he was offering. And what was the comments of the band in response to Kevin Jennings uh, mentioning that a number of times? Uh, it, was, it was never something the band considered. It was always, well, thank you, Kevin. You know, that, uh, <laughs> that would be great, but that's not something you have experience in. Uh, you know, you need, you know we, we need someone who's done this before. We have bigger, we, we, we want this thing to go a little, we want bigger, we have a bigger scope than just being a band from Atlanta with an Atlanta manager, you know, with a friend as a manager who, you know, we saw things as we needed somebody in either New York or L.A. who had done it before and who had all the contacts necessary to get a band off the ground. Well, once again, that was one of the band members. We've heard from the two brothers who were also band members and one the lead sing singer, uh, Chris Robinson. We're just saying, too, that when you have everybody here has a vested interest in this trial, how is that jury going to determine who's telling the truth here? Well, it's not an easy task, is it? I, you know, they have to look, I guess, at any number of things. You look at the demeanor of the witnesses, you look at what each of them did before and after, and you try to decide which story is more likely. But you're right, it's a terrible thing for a jury to try to figure out Who's telling the truth when every witness has a bias? Including managers up there because they're going to get X percentage of whatever it is the band gets and they don't want to have it going out to someone else if that little percentage needs to come back in. Well, except the manager's percentage comes off the top. So they've uh, been paid. They've been paid and it shouldn't affect them, at least not under the technical terms of their agreement. Let's walk through this again in terms of what the plaintiff says has happened and talk about this in terms of contracts. Now he says they knew the relationship he had with the previous band, the Georgia Satellite, they being the Black Crows. And so he says, I want the same deal that I have with them, with you. No, actually, he says that every time they talked about his compensation, he'd say, we'll talk about it when there's something to discuss. But this night of January 2nd, they sat down to make the decision to hire Angelus and Whitley as the professional managers for the band. They committed that, that Kevin Jennings would be the tour manager for the band, and Rich Robinson said to him, according to Kevin Jennings, we'll give you the same deal you had with the satellites. Which is 
partnership. Which is, you're our tour manager and you get a band member's share. All right, well now Lisa, let's talk about when there's an oral contract here. How do you prove an oral contract in a court of law? Well, you have to look at, you have to talk to the individuals who were there who were talking about it. You have to see if there are any contemporaneous writings, any notes that could inform that, um, and see what evidence there is of what the intention of the parties was. Yeah, we've been talking too about that pie chart there. Now, how again, Jane, are they, the defendants interpreting this, and how does the plaintiff interpret that drawing of where everything is, is, is divided up into one six? Well, the plaintiff says that after Rich Robinson had made him this offer of the same deal he had with the satellites, that Steve Gorman drew the pie chart and that, that Rich Robinson saw it, held it up and said, this will be our contract, we'll all sign it, and this will be our contract. And that those six slices memorialized the agreement that he would get a partner share. Now, what the defense says is, no, 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 no. We were just, Gorman says, we were trying to reassure Kevin Jennings that he would always be our friend. And I drew this circle of friendship and put him in it with us. And that's all it meant. A circle of friendship. All right, we'll see much more about this. Jane, you're leaving us, but I understand you'll be around with uh, primetime justice as well as to help us out around here. So once again, a pleasure. Too short, but always a pleasure. Thank you. Lisa, you're staying. We'll take a break here. Once again, when we come back, we'll continue with the direct of Steve Gorman, again, a band member of the Black Crows. Stay with us. More to come. A lot about this pie chart that was drawn up by Mr. Gorman. He's a, the witness that's presently on the stand. Whether or not it was supposedly an example or a support of an oral contract between the parties or whether or not it was just a souvenir of friends with a fan, as the defense seems to maintain. Well, let's go in and hear what he has to say as Mr. Gorman, a band member for the Black Crows, continues his direct examination. Let's go back into the courtroom. What do you recall about uh, January the 2nd of 1990? Um, well, I, first of all, I don't recall that it was January 2nd. That's the date on, the, on Exhibit A. So we've all, I mean, that, that night I specifically remember a good bit about it. Was it, uh, can you place it in context as to uh, when it was after you got back from the holidays? And it, yeah, it was a few days after. I'd probably been home four or five days at that point. Um, without uh, pinning you down as to whether it was that particular date, mm -hmm. can you relate to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what happened that evening? Yes, I can. Uh, we, the band was at Kevin's house. All, all five of us were over there. And the decision had definitely been made. We knew Pete and Patrick were going to manage the band. We had, they had offered and we said, sure. I mean, we, that was a done deal. As far in our minds, we we had made that decision. Uh, that was the discussion of the day. That was everything we were talking about for the first time since we made a record. We had something to talk about. We had a positive direction. I mean, Pete Angelus had said, "Here's an outline. Here's a game plan," and we said, "Let's do it." And so that was a very big time for us. Every conversation with Pete made us feel better and better about what was going to happen. So we were very excited. Um, that was the that was the whole every conversation every bit of the evening revolved around those points and just us discussing what we had hoped what we were hoping for and what we knew would probably happen was kevin jennings part of those discussions yes he was uh was what was his attitude and what were were his comments about uh, his attitude i think he was happy that we were happy, and he saw it as a good thing. I mean, of the managers we discussed, I remember him saying, Pete's probably the best one. Uh, he was concerned, again, uh, with what he, where he was going to fit into this picture. He seemed to be, I mean, to me at the time, I thought he was actually acting a little paranoid about it. I was, uh, Kevin's attitude was, well, this is great for you guys, but what about me? That's the way I would say he was. Uh, did you attempt to reassure him that he would have a job with the band if y'all had any mm -hmm. say so in? Yes, I did. I, the, at the time that I started talking to Kevin, it was a conversation just between myself and Kevin. Now, had there, was there a two and a half hour band meeting that evening? No, not at all. There was no meeting 
you know, scheduled meeting where we dis everybody was discussing all these issues. There was never a, a two-hour meeting. You know, we don't take minutes. We don't uh, we don't vote aye and nay on things. You know, we just were hanging out, discussing the future. Were all of you in one room, or were people coming and going and just kind of uh, for for a time for a time we were all in one room. That would be coming. And, there was a lot of coming and goings, but yeah, everybody would when a group is having a discussion. Yeah, we were sure we were in one room for a good part of that. Uh, what did Kevin have to say about uh, uh, <clears throat> exactly what role he wanted with the bank? Um, I, I'm not sure what Kevin, if he stated he wanted a role. I know that I told him, I specifically said to Kevin, well, in my mind, you're going to be our tour manager. I want you for the job. I don't know where these concerns are coming from because we had discussed and I let him know that, you know, I was strongly behind him going on tour with us as a tour manager. His concerns came more from, he said, once we get out there, you know, new management's coming in, they're going to have different ideas. And he was very concerned about a, a wedge. I'm not saying he used that word, but he was saying, it's going to be different. We're going to work together. They're going to get in between myself and the band. The things that we've done and, you know, this friendship we formed, it's not going to be the same. I mean, Kevin, we were all very happy that fall. We had a, a, a meeting place. We had a place. We could go hang in his house and rehearse there and watch TV. I mean, it was like it was a, that was our clubhouse, and we loved it. And he didn't want to see that end, and he was very concerned about it. Was there any mention at that time about Kevin being a partner with the band? No, Did not at all. Did anybody say anything like that? No, never. Did anybody? that evening at any time say, Kevin, we want you to have the same deal that you had with the Georgia Satellites? No. Did Rich say anything like that? No. Uh, tell us, if you will, just what happened in your own words uh, from your recollection. What happened in my own words was, at the time, if you're, if you're getting around to Exhibit A, That's what I'm getting around to. Which I drew. Um, that was done that Kevin and I were discussing the things I had just talked about. I was reassuring him, A, we're all still friends, and B, in my opinion, he should be on tour with us when we go. He should be our tour manager. Uh, that was, it didn't seem to be getting anywhere. Kevin you know, was very concerned. He, was, he had a lot of insecurities, and he wasn't afraid to show them to me. I mean, he, wasn't, you know, he was stating very clearly, I'm worried about this. I don't trust management. It's going to be different. That, after, you know, a few minutes of he and I discussing this, I was getting irritated. I'm, I saw it as, you know, we've got this great situation. Everything is looking up. We've got the most, fo you know, we've got focus. We've got someone who's offering to, you know, who knows what's going to happen. who has got a game plan for us. I used to say the word game plan. And here was Kevin really concerned about his own position in that, which I can I'm, understand people being concerned for themselves, but in light of the rest of the mood, it started to get a little annoying, and I was not that pleased with him going on and on about what's, what about me, what about me. And so what did you do? After, the, after we went back and forth a few times, I was sitting there with a, there was a notepad in front of me where I had just been doing my little drawings as I like to do, and doodling. I would call it doodling. Uh, that's certainly the extent of it. I, uh, a lot of stick figures. Um, I, I, was, I was at my wits. I was frustrated with Kevin. And I drew up this little circle and put all of our names in it, this little circle of friendship. And Is this that's. The, the, the names right here? That's it. And you wrote that yourself? Yes, I did. And what did you write that for? I wrote that as a gesture, A, I meant what I was telling him. We're friends here. And in my mind, you're coming out with us. Don't worry about it. I wrote that after I'd gotten to the point where I was a little irritated with him. And that was done sarcastically. The message wasn't sarcastic. There's a nuance of, you know, I'm looking you in the eye, and I'm telling you I'm a little annoyed with you. I'm being honest. You're not paying attention. That's not working. I'm handing you this. You know, I'm ramming the point home. I'm irritated. This conversation's over. I want to go back with the other happy people and 
be happy again. This is getting old. And so, uh, what happened then after you drew the circle and put, printed the names in it? What happened then was I handed that to Kevin and I was through with it. I, I don't recall a single thing happening after that other than next subject, I moved on. Uh, did you continue talking with Kevin? No, not at that time. Uh, that, was, that was my capper. Just, <laughs> I've, I've reassured you enough. There's a signature down here at the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, is that your signature? Uh, yes, it is. Do you recall actually signing it? I, I don't recall actually signing it, but that is, that is my signature at the time, yeah. I've since changed the way I sign things, but that's it, yeah. Uh, is, do you recall anybody else around here signing? No, I don't recall anyone signing their name to the, to the, the pie chart, to the piece of paper, to the exhibit. I don't recall anyone signing it. Did you get up and leave the room after that, or did you stay in the room? Uh, I was, once I had handed it away, um, I believe I left the room. I know that I had, I had drawn it up and I was still in the context of the conversation with Kevin, and I know people were coming and going around it, um, but, but I, once I had finished and said, man, that's it, that, I, that's, I, I, I think I would have left the room, or if I stayed there, I certainly moved on to another subject with you know, one of the other guys. Do you recall any other conversation about uh, this note or Exhibit A or so-called pie chart? Or no, I don't. Did Kevin uh, seem satisfied when he got uh, the Hi, Char. Do you have I, any impression about what his uh, the conversation was? the conversation ended at that point? I assumed he he understood what I was telling him. Um, I don't recall satisfaction or displeasure. I don't recall anything. That was just a conversation had ended. That was it. Did you, as a partner in the Black Crows band, agree? on January the 2nd, 1990, or on any other date, mm -hmm. make Kevin Jennings a partner with the musicians in the band? No. Did you intend Exhibit A or, or Plaintiff's Exhibit 1, this so-called pie chart, mm -hmm. to be a partnership agreement? Absolutely not. Did you intend uh, this Plaintiff's Exhibit number 1 to be any kind of an agreement? Absolutely not. Kevin Jennings referred to it as a souvenir in his mm -hmm. uh, testimony. Uh, is that something that uh, you intended? <laughs> I never had any intentions for it other than what I stated, which was, let's move on. I mean, that was, like I said, my intention for that, for that drawing was, I've had enough of this conversation. Just put a sock in it. Did you ever agree to give Kevin Jennings a share of the profits of the band? No, never. Did you ever agree to give Kevin Jennings the same deal that he had with the Georgia Satellites? Never. Once again, as we're hearing from this witness, I drew it up, but I saw it only as a circle of friendship, nothing more. That pie chart that the plaintiff says underscores the fact that a contract existed between the parties. We'll take a break and come back with more of the direct examination of Steve Gorman. More to come.
Once again, if you take away nothing else from a trial like the one we're presently showing you, it should be that even if you're good friends, even relatives, that when it comes to business, please put it in writing. And that's exactly the situation with Kevin Jennings. He said he had an oral contract making him an equal partner with the Black Crows Rock and Roll Band. The band says no, an oral contract did not exist. They indicated to him that he would have a job with them as tour manager, but certainly not a partnership or now, then, or at any point in time. And the pie chart that was drawn up, we're hearing from the witness that's presently on the stand. He said, I drew it up at best you can call a circle of friendship, a way in which of moving the conversation away from the negative to the positive. And now we move into this day when the album was being released. This is January 1990. And Steve Garman on the stand, a band member, is continuing to give his direct testimony, indicating what happened the day the party occurred that January. Let's go back into the courtroom. I never saw Kevin that day. He never called you? I never heard from him during the day, no. Uh, and he never came to the point? No, he didn't. Did not, he while, not while we were there. <laughs> Did he help uh, load up any of the gear? No, he didn't. Did he take the gear back to his house? No, he didn't. When was the next time you heard from Kevin? I heard from Kevin later that night. Uh, it was late midnight or maybe even 1 o'clock probably closer to midnight, he called me at my house. What did he say? He said, I'm a dad. And he was very excited and just not making a lot of sense. But he said, I'm, I'm a dad, I gotta talk to you. This has been the craziest day of my life. You won't believe this story I have. And I just said, <laughs> he said, I'm a dad. And I said, who's the mother, you know? <laughs> kind of, I was like, well, I didn't think that would be good news. I didn't, you know. And he said, no, Holly, Holly had a baby. And I was like, really? Well, that's interesting. And I just thought it was, I, I didn't know what to think. And he said, I need to talk to you about it. And I said, okay. And he said, let's go get a beer. And I said, great. And we got off the phone and I, you know, looked at my roommate and I said, well, Kevin's coming over and he's a dad now. You know, we were kind of laughing because I thought there was going to be some other point to it. I thought it was like some other story he was going to tell. And he was, I didn't take it seriously. And he came to my house and picked me up and we drove to the point together, always at the good old point, and uh, went in and sat down, ordered a couple beers, and he told me the story about his son. What did he tell you? He said, uh, he just told me the same story we've heard. He said he got up that morning, and Holly said she felt very sick and had to go to the hospital, and she, I remember him saying it was female trouble or girl trouble, something like that, which he didn't know what that meant. And she went to the hospital and he was sort of, he was in the dark all day long and he told me about going in to see her and she just screamed her head off, like, get out of here, I don't want you here. And he was very confused about that. And he said, uh, after a while, he had to go home. He told me about making some phone calls and calling to the hospital from home to find out about Holly's condition and that at some point somebody said, yeah, you know, she's fine, she had a boy, and he didn't believe it, and went through the whole argument with someone on the phone. And he finally just went down to the hospital and was, you know, shown his son. He had had a kid. Did he say anything else to you? Oh, yeah, yeah. He said, he gave me that part of the story, which was what I was <laughs> quite interested in, you know. Um, and he said things had really changed for him that day. And... It didn't look like his life was going to turn out the way he had seen it just a day before. He said, this is a sign from the man upstairs, which I took to mean God. Um, he said, I've got to straighten out my life. I've got to get a few things in order. I've got to marry Holly because that's the right thing to do. I've got to raise this son. That's the right thing to do. He's very specific about those points. He said, I'm not going to be able to work with the band. I'm not going to Los Angeles. You guys go have a great trip. When you come home, we'll see you then. Uh, I'm not sure if he said anything in regard to the satellites. He said, but this is what's for the best. I've got to get a real job where I can stay at home. And the, the word he used in relation to the Black Crows was, I think we need a clean break anyway. He had been worried about Pete and Patrick's involvement. I need a clean break from the band. This was, you know, starting to concern me. 
good luck, Godspeed, you always have a friend. That's what is most important to me, we'll always be friends. And I said, of course we will. And he said, so I quit respectfully and that is, you know, it was a very, it was a, it was a, I, it was a touching type of moment. I mean, he's just had this son and he is in shock, but he told me very specifically, I'm gonna, I quit, thanks for the offer. I've got far bigger responsibilities now. When he said he quit, was there any reference to being the tour manager? Uh, I don't know a specific reference. I mean, that's what I took it to be. And I know that he was, the one thing he was definitely going to do was go to Los Angeles. And I know he said he couldn't do that. And then he said, I, you know, I need, a, I need a job where I'm staying at home, very specifically. I have a family now. Was there anything else that happened in that conversation? Uh, yeah, he did tell me that he had been, he had grown concerned with the band. He said, again, feeling he could tell me, you know, I, I was always had a sympathy, it, sympathetic ear to Kevin. He told me he wasn't sure if he trusted Chris and Johnny, which I didn't ask him what that meant and I didn't, he didn't expand on it. He said, I think you and Jeff are the nice guys who I feel most comfortable with. Chris and Johnny, I'm not really sure about. I don't think I trust them. And he said, I don't have any, you know, Rich and I never had any kind of a relationship. You know, he doesn't have a handle on Rich anyway. And he didn't want things to go in any other direction than what we had had, which was a lot of good times at his house. That was what was most important to him. And I said, no problem. Did you make any promises to Kevin that he would have a job uh, at some future point with the band? No, I did not. Did you make, make any statements like that? No, I did not. Did you reassure him that he could come back at any time in the future? No, I did not. We're just discussing early on about the credibility issue here with everybody having a vested interest in the outcome of this trial. Lisa, let me ask you, Stephen Gorman seems to have a very credible uh, presentation on that stand. And we're just wondering what it is about this witness that stands out most in your mind. Well, I think the story that he tells is a very straightforward one. He says that, you know, on the January 2nd meeting that they were all excited about their album and that their, their new management arrangement and that Kevin was focused on what was going to happen with him and that he drew up this pie chart to reassure him, yes, you're our friend and yes, we'd like you to be the tour manager, but nothing more than that. And then he tells a very straightforward story about Kevin coming to him and saying, I've had a child, I can't travel all over the country, I have to quit, I need a clean break. It just sounds, it makes sense, it's very credible, it's very logical and, and straightforward. Well, let's see as we go back into the courtroom for the conclusion of the direct examination of Steve Gorman, again, one of the members of the Black Crow Rock and Roll Band. When was the next time that you saw or talked to Kevin? I, I don't think I saw him again until that the following, almost the end of that year, 1990. So you didn't go back over to his house any time in February? Uh, not that I remember, no, I don't. When was the next time that you did see Kevin? Uh, at the end of the year, we had been on tour for 10 months at that point. We came back to Atlanta and played Center Stage Theater for three nights, and I saw him then, right just before Christmas, so that was December of 1990. And can you tell us about what happened there? Um, yeah, I got a ride home from Kevin from one of the shows. I think it was the third show of the three. And he... I don't remember how we hooked up or how I got the ride. I just know he, he gave me a ride home. A uh, home which at the time was at a friend's apartment who I was <laughs> crashing there. It was, well, my girlfriend, I should say, at the time. So I was, I was with her and her two lovely roommates. And this was in Midtown. And we drove in his car. Just he took me right there from center stage. What did Kevin say to you? He told me that... He thought that the band owed him something. He asked me specifically for $5,000 that night. What did you say in response to that? I asked him where you came up with that figure. What, what is this $5,000? And I said, did we not just reimburse you for the, the expenses you covered? And he said, yes, you did, but this is for my time. And I think he had figured out it was $200 a week for 
uh, what, however many weeks that is, four months, three months, that adds up to $5,000. Uh, and what did you say in response to that? I, I was surprised. I told him, I don't think we owe you anything for your time. That was never something that was addressed, and if we owed you something for your time, then we owed a lot of people something for their time. Did you suggest that he talk to somebody else? Uh, I, I think I said, well, if you have a, you know, if you want to talk about this anyway, you should really talk to Chris or Rich. Cause I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I can't make a decision for the band, and I'm not the person who makes decisions for the band. And I was sort of you know, deferring him, like, you know, get off my back, you can go talk to these guys. I, I didn't, I didn't have anything to say about payment or anything. That just didn't make any sense to me. He, uh, he was convinced that we were doing extraordinarily well. Were you? And he kept, no, <laughs> no, not at all. We, uh, he, he told me, he said, I know you can afford it now. Things are going great. And I just think that, you know, you can afford this. I need a little something for my time. And I was not do. I had not been, I earned per diems that year. And the band was, I just had my day to day money. And I told him that and I, I remember sitting there in, in his car thinking, you got a car and you're asking me for money. I didn't have a dime. Did you talk to Kevin after that? Um, no, I think that was the last conversation I had with Kevin. Coming up, the cross-examination of this witness. Stay with us. More to come. Friend seems to have done very well under direct examination. Let's see if he holds up under cross-examination. Let's go back into the courtroom. During uh, 1989 or early 90, do you remember seeing the business card that's been introduced into evidence in this case with Kevin Jennings' name on it, the Black Crow's business card? Yes. And uh, do you, when do you recall seeing that? Uh, I don't recall a when I first saw it specifically at all. I know that when I, when I saw it a few years ago, I said, oh, I've seen that. I remembered it. I don't know when I first saw it. Would it be safe to say that you saw it prior to the album release party at the point on January 24th? Yes, it would be of safe to say that. Okay. Yes. And uh, to your knowledge, did you or anyone ever object to Kevin Jennings having that Black Crow's business card? Nope. I believe you testified at the album release party that when Kevin Jennings didn't show up that next day, mm -hmm. that the, the equipment was taken to your house? Yes, it was. Was all the equipment taken to your house? As far as I remember it, I mean, something could have been left in a vehicle or someone might have grabbed their own guitar. I mean, my equipment and the bulk of the equipment Definitely more than just mine, or, you know, was taken to my house, yes. And, and who took it to your house? Uh, Chris and myself, and I think, I, that's who I specifically remember. I wanted to say Randy was there, but I don't know for sure. I can't say that 100%. During the fall of 89 and, and January of 1990, did the band ever take their equipment to your house previous to this no. point? No, that was the only time. I believe you stated uh, that you met George DeCoulias in the spring of 1988 in New York and the band began doing demos with George at some point after that. Yes. Okay. And you continued doing demos with George DeCoulias uh, throughout 88 and early 99. Early 89. Is that correct? We, we, did, we did a demo session with him and we continued a relationship with him. We weren't in and out of the studio a lot during that time with him. But was, was George Aculius working with the band during that period? Oh, yes, yeah. Okay, did you have a written contract with George Aculius? Not at all. Uh, it was just an oral agreement with him, isn't that true? Uh, there wasn't, there was, there was no agreement. There was, there was nothing we agreed on. We were friends, and we discussed working together in the future, and we, that, that was our relationship. We hadn't agreed to anything. We were just communicating. 
And there'll be more about this trial later on on Primetime Justice. Our time is almost running out here. Lisa, a couple of things let's talk about. One being that this tour management, it would be very unusual to have two managers uh, who are taking a percentage out of the income that's going in. Um, more than unusual, it basically does not happen unless you have a situation where you have a previous manager and then you have a new manager taking over. In a situation where you have a tour manager, they never have that kind of a large percentage. They usually are on a salaried basis or they get a percentage of the income from the live shows but not the income of the band overall. So it's definitely a very atypical situation. And also this bit about I want five thousand dollars from you. Now he didn't get five thousand. In fact he got three hundred dollars and they said that was a record of whether showing an agreement between the parties. Now what if that wasn't what he wanted to have happen? How could he have changed or altered that? Well he should have uh, when he endorsed the check he should have put partial settlement or accepted under protest or some indication that this did not constitute a full satisfaction of his claim. But by having no notation and endorsing the check, he opens himself up to the claim that, well, you've accepted $300 as settlement for your claim. And his com you said a little bit early on that his comment back as, a, as reported in direct examination by Mr. Gorman that I'm a father now, it's not time for me to, to get out of this. What does that do with if there was in fact a partnership? Does that sever it at that point in time or what? What do we have here? I think so. I think he's, you know, at that point withdrawing it. He used, if uh, we believe Steve Gorman, he used the terms a clean break, you guys go on, I can't go to Los Angeles, I'll see you when I get back. So he was basically withdrawing at that point, the end of January. So you've got from January 2nd to January 24th, I believe it is. I don't know what he could be entitled to for three weeks of, of being involved with the band. And if you're t taking an accounting during that three weeks, if nothing was in there to get your one-sixth from, then you're entitled to... To nothing. It's only after the money starts coming in, and at that point, if his words are to be uh, uh, accepted as the truth of what's going on, that he has dissolved whatever the relationship was at that point. Yes. Credibility. There you go. All right, now, if really, very quickly then, what should we look for it again in terms of what the defense is going to be doing coming up now? Other credibility issues or what? I think other credibility issues. I think they should be trying to bolster what Steve Gorman has um, put out in testimony as to what the sequence of events and what the intention of the parties were, and they should try to find other evidence that supports their, that version of the events. Lisa, this was your first time on Court TV, and I certainly hope it won't be your last. Come back and visit us again. Thanks so much. And coming up will be Primetime Justice with Terry Moran. He'll continue with this trial, once again, that of Kevin Jennings versus Black Crow Rock and Roll Band. More to come. Stay with us. Founding fathers wrote the Constitution. They made sure that trials in the bold new experiment called America would be public. So courtrooms were built with large audience galleries, and people watched the debates that transfixed the community. She may not die. She may end up a vegetable. Courts haven't changed, and neither has our desire to witness these events firsthand. Court TV, an idea as old as America. For the latest verdicts and information from the trials covered on Court TV, you are invited to call the Court TV verdict line at 1-800-COURT-56. Coming up tonight on Primetime Justice, a contract dispute with Kevin Jennings has struck a sour note with the popular rock band The Black Crows. 
Members of the band come to court to say Jennings never wanted to be an equal partner in the band in the first place. He was in shock, but he told me very specifically, I'm gonna, I quit, thanks for the offer. I've got far bigger responsibilities now. Plus, as the plaintiff's case winds down, we'll preview the defense case in the wrongful death lawsuit brought by Eric Johnson. Johnson says negligent hospital security was the reason that a homeless man was able to rape and kill his wife, who was a doctor at Bellevue Hospital in New York. Coming up next on Primetime Justice. I'm Terry Moran. Tonight we focus on a case from Atlanta that raises a profound question in the civil law. When is a deal a deal? Now the case of Kevin Jennings versus the Black Crows may not at first appear to be all that profound. I know it's only rock and roll, but I like it. And it's a huge business where tens of millions of dollars are made with dizzying speed and deafening sound. So how do the business law principles of partnership, enforceable agreements, and the proper wind-up of affairs fit in the heady, informal business of rock and roll? Court TV's Greg Jarrett lays out the facts of this case centering on a hit record and a pie chart. This is the Black Crows, a popular rock band originally from Atlanta, Georgia. So far, the band has released three albums in the U.S., including their 1990 debut hit, Shake Your Money Maker, which has sold over five million copies. At the time the album was released, Kevin Jennings was working with the Black Crows. He claims he was the band's manager and partner. The band says he was a friend, a fan, and sometimes a roadie, but that's all. This disagreement has led to a court battle. Jennings is suing the band in this Atlanta court, claiming he is owed a share of the profits from its hugely successful first album. They leaned across the table and they put their hands together and they all shook hands, one for all, all for one. This is a partnership. That partnership, Jennings claims, took shape when the band was still a struggling group, playing the local clubs in Atlanta. Jennings let the band rehearse in the basement of his home, in fact, Jennings says the idea for their partnership was hatched at his dining room table. It's this pie chart that Jennings claims proves he is entitled to one-sixth of the profits from the band's first album. The band members admit they signed the pie chart, but they say it was nothing more than a souvenir for Jennings. According to their attorney, Jennings, like other friends of the band, was a roadie. Kevin's a, a roadie. And he started hauling their gear and saying, hey, let me take care of that. The band said, hey, great. Uh, he wasn't the only one. There were several other friends who did the same thing. But Jennings claims he was much more than a friend to the band. He says that he was crucial to their success. It's now up to the jury to decide if Kevin Jennings will get a piece of the pie. Greg Jarrett, Court TV. One of the first issues a jury must decide in a case like this one is what was in the minds of the people who made or didn't make the agreement in dispute. Well, when plaintiff Kevin Jennings took the witness stand and told jurors about the night he and the Black Crows sat around his dinner table and drew up that pie chart, he left no doubt what was in his mind. He'd struck a deal. Rich finally turned around and said, well, how about we give you the same deal you had with the satellites? And I took quite a pause before I smiled and said, that would be great. I was a little uh, overwhelmed. I, I didn't expect that. And um, so after I and uh, found the words to say thank you and I made a little speech about what I would do and how I would I would be there for them 
like I was with the satellites. And that was 365 days a year. And we all put our hands in the middle of the table and we shook. Well, on cross-examination of the plaintiff, Jerry Blackstock, the lawyer for the band, sought to show that the document at the heart of this dispute, that pie chart, is nothing more than a souvenir, and that Kevin Jennings has always looked at it that way, too. You correct me if I'm wrong. In your deposition, beginning at line five, are these your words? Steve Wright Gorman, he took this piece of note paper and he drew the pie chart because he knew what Rich was talking about and then he handed it to me as a souvenir and I smiled and I looked at it. Is that what you said then? That's what I said, yeah. And you held this thing as a treasure to the point where you put it on the wall in your house. Isn't that right? That's right. Court TV's Jane Okrasinski covered this trial for us, and she joins us now to discuss it as we take a close look at it tonight. Jane, you watched this trial unfold. What were the, the key elements in evidence that the jurors were asked to focus on? Well, the main thing for this jury is determining credibility. What people said and what they intended. You have two very different stories about what happened that night and what people were thinking. And so the whole issue is, if all your witnesses have a vested interest in the outcome, how do you decide who to believe? And so we saw a little bit of the plaintiff there, and tonight we're going to take a look at the defense. Rock stars, really. Rock stars on the witness stand. How did, how did that work in court? Whenever a celebrity comes to court, there is some baggage on the stand. How did that play out? Well, I'm not sure that there was too much celebrity baggage, but there was definitely a difference in how these band members seemed to play to this jury. Some of the band members seemed to play much better and much more credibly to the jury than others. How so? Well, it's hard to say. I, I think, you know, it's that, those kinds of um, intangible qualities of substance and reasonableness. Do they, do they remember everything sort of in the same amount, or do they forget the important parts or the tricky parts and remember only the other stuff. Um, and again, I think that, that there, were, there was perceived to be a real difference among the members of the Black Crows in how substantial a witness they were. Well, we'll see some of that testimony a little bit later. Another thing that happens when celebrities are in court is that sometimes they're in court because they're hauled there by people who want a piece of their celebrity action. In other words, in this case, we have the Black Crows, big rock stars, Kevin Jennings, at least in the wider world, a uh, nobody. Is that what this case is about? Well, that's what the defendants will tell you this case is about. But what the plaintiffs say is, that may be true now, but on January the 2nd, 1990, Kevin Jennings was a pro. Kevin Jennings had toured all over the world with the Georgia Satellites, a band that he had been largely responsible for making a success. The Black Crows were a baby band. They had an album in the can, but they hadn't sold a single record and they couldn't even cover their expenses on the concert gigs that they played. So who was the big man then and who was the nobody? And that's the challenge for the plaintiff here to get them to see the situation a little bit in reverse. That's right. Jane, thanks for joining us tonight. You're see welcome. You soon. Well, we're going to break away right now and when we come back, begin with our coverage tonight of the case against the Black Crows. These are the members of the band on stage in their music video, but is there another full partner in the group in court? We'll be back in a minute. The basic question in the case of Kevin Jennings versus the Black Crows, which we turn to now, is simple. Was there a deal? Well, there's probably been more law made and then unmade, analyzed, and remade on that seemingly simple question than on almost any other subject. Kevin Jennings, the plaintiff in this case, says he had a deal with the Black Crows rock band, a deal that would make him, as the band's road manager, a full partner in all the group's profits. And Jennings has a piece of paper he says proves his claim. It's a pie chart, 
signed by the band, though whether all actually signed is a fact in dispute in this case, and titled Heavy, Heavy Symbolism. So how will the jury figure out whether or not Kevin Jennings has a legitimate claim here? Well, a long time ago, a jury in a case like this one would be asked to look only at what the parties did, not what they might have thought when the deal in question was struck. The law, said Oliver Wendell Holmes, has nothing to do with the actual state of the parties' minds. It must go by externals and judge parties by their conduct. Well, Holmes has been overruled by time, and now juries must look at whether there was a meeting of the minds as well as the parties' external conduct. And here in a plaintiff's witness, Dan Baird, the jurors hear the kind of deal that Kevin Jennings was accustomed to having in the world of rock and roll. Dan Baird is with the band The Georgia Satellites, in which Jennings was a full partner and road manager. And here is how Baird described the deal that Jennings had with that band on the witness stand. When Kevin came back from England and he had you know, this, this record deal for us, which was basically a gift to us. We, you know, we, none of us thought he would ever get anything going. He came back and we started talking about, you know, working and we were all getting along and it was going really well. And we talked about going over to England almost immediately. And one night over at my house, Kevin, there were all five of us were there. Kevin and the four band members. And Kevin's brought up what I want from you guys for what I've done is to be treated as an equal member of the band with an opinion and the monies to be shared the same except for songwriting royalties, which since one person or two people individually write a song, it's kind of hard to just give it to everybody. And so Kevin became a 20% partner, basically, in the band. And we all shook on it, you know, at the house. And that was sometime in late 85. It, was Kevin made an equal partner with the band? Yes, he was. And how long was he treated as an equal partner of the, the Georgia Satellites? For approximately five years. And was he given an equal share of all the income that the band earned? All revenues except for songwriting. Okay, during that period... Well, on cross-examination by the band's attorney, by the Black Crow's attorney, Dan Baird admitted that was a very unusual arrangement to give someone who wasn't a performer, who wasn't uh, part of the artistic end of the business, a full share in the band's operations. Uh, the plaintiff also called his wife to the witness stand. Holly Jennings is a percipient witness to the deal. She saw uh, the shaking of hands and the making of that pie chart and the signing of it on January 2nd, 1990 at Jennings' home. She took the witness stand and she told the jurors what she recalled. Mrs. Jennings, uh, do you recall any meeting of the Black Crows band and Kevin Jennings on January 2nd, 1990? Yes, I do. And when did that meeting take place on that day? Sometime between 6 and 8, somewhere around there. And where was that meeting conducted? In the dining room. And were you present at that meeting? No, I was in the living room. And who was in attendance first in the dining room at that meeting? And then tell me who was in the house. In attendance in the dining room would be Kevin and Rich and Chris and Steve and Johnny and Jeff. And then who else was in the house uh, other than the band and Kevin Jennings? In the living room would be myself, Kevin's sister Debbie, her boyfriend Mark Newman, and Ronnie Douglas. Was Randy Talensky there that night? No. Do you remember uh, when the, the meeting broke up? Yes. And what do you remember uh, about the meeting breaking up? It was a couple of hours later, maybe two, two and a half hours later, and Kevin brought the pie chart into the kitchen, the living room, great room area, and his sister and I, we all looked at it, and Johnny and Rich 
okay, everybody was just sort of happy. I mean, it was just... of the meeting it was about two, two and a half hours. Okay. And who you referred to the pie chart? that this is what you're referring to as the flat pie chart? Yes, sir. Okay. When did you first see the, this pie chart document? The night of January 2nd, 1990. And how did you come to see it? Kevin brought it into the kitchen with the band and showed it to us. We were all looking at his sister and her boyfriend and I. And were any of the members of the pros present? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And who was present? Johnny and Rich and Steve, I believe. And where were uh, Chris Robinson and Jeff Seeds? Chris and Jeff, I believe, were there for a minute, but they didn't stay very long afterwards, after the meeting was over. Okay. Did Kevin Jennings say anything to you related to the pie chart in the presence of Johnny, Steve, or Rich? Yeah, he said, he's in, it's all right, he's in, he's one of the band, he's one of them. And, and who was standing there, uh, was a member of the Black Crows? When Johnny, Rich. Said? I know Johnny and Rich were, I believe Steve was as well. Did any member of the Black Crows say anything in regard to Kevin's statement or the pie chart document? Yeah, Johnny said, you got the same deal, you're one of us, and gave Kevin a hug. And Richie said, yeah, you're one of us, buddy, you're in, and same, he didn't hug him, but it was the same thing. So the plaintiff's wife testifies without reservation that, in fact, a deal was struck at her home back in 1990. When we come back, we'll find out whether or not the plaintiff might have left the partnership on account of the couple's unexpected baby. For the latest verdicts and information from the trials covered on Court TV, you are invited to call the Court TV verdict line at 1-800-COURT-56. So I said, well, uh, could you check on it, please, and find out what happened, and, you know, is, is everything all right? Is, is she okay? And she came back and said, uh, she's fine, she had a baby boy. Which was, uh, well, the biggest shock that I'll ever have as long as I ever live. Um, and I, I froze. Um, I was, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, absolutely shocking. And there was no way. Well, it's an unusual side story in this case. Plaintiff Kevin Jennings there testifying that in January 1990, an unexpected baby came into his life. He was uh, living with his girlfriend, now wife, Holly Jennings, and one day she went to the hospital and he discovered later that she had had a child. Now, it's relevant in this case because that baby led to understandably more responsibility in Kevin Jennings' life, and so he didn't go on tour with the Black Crows. And the Crows say that he didn't held up his end of whatever deal might have been struck. They deny that any deal was struck in the first place. On the witness stand, Holly Jennings explained how it could be that she didn't tell her boyfriend, or anyone really, that she was about to have a child. And was the album uh, release party a success? Yes. Mrs. Jennings, uh, were you pregnant at that time? Yes, I was. And did you have a baby the next day? Yes, I did. Had 
at that time, prior to having the baby, and was this your first child? Yes. Prior to having your first child, had you told anyone that you were pregnant? No. Had you told Kevin? No. Had you told your mother? No. Had you told your brother? No. Your family? No. Your friends? No. Why hadn't you told anyone, particularly Kevin Jennings, that you were pregnant? When I found out I was pregnant, he was so right. consumed. Just one moment. We'll hear Wait one second. Let me explain to the witness. We're going to hear Mr. Blackstock's objection, so you may not answer. Mr. Blackstock, now. Uh, I object on the grounds of relevance. I know this is a, an emotional thing for these folks, but I don't think it has a thing to do with uh, this case as to why she didn't tell him she was pregnant. All right, I'll overrule the objection. Go forward. You may answer the question. Okay. Um, Kevin was completely consumed with working with the Black Crows, leaving the satellites who he'd been working for for 10 years. It was a big decision. And I didn't want to influence his decision in any way. I wanted him to follow his heart and do what he really wanted to do. And so Holly Jennings explaining there how this circumstance came about, this unexpected child in Kevin Jennings' life, which did affect his relationship with the Black Crows. On cross-examination, the Crows' lawyer, Jerry Blackstock, tried to pin down Holly Jennings on that night that the pie chart was drawn up and signed, and he may have gotten more than he bargained for in this line. On January the 2nd, 1990, when the band was present and this uh, so-called pie chart was drawn up, I believe you said that you were not present in the meeting at the time, is that correct? That is correct. And you did not hear anything that was said in that meeting at the time, did you? No, sir. And isn't it true that Randy Talinsky was in the house that day? No, sir. When I asked you that question at your deposition, didn't you say, no, I believe he was there that day? No, I corrected it on my copy of the deposition. That I corrected a lot of things, the court reporter, and it was, no, I do not believe he was there. And I, I said that I didn't have that correction on mine. Um, is that something you told I submitted it, yeah. yeah. But you don't remember Randy Talinsky's being there? No. standing around were having a few drinks and had a few drinks after that is that correct yes you said that uh, rich was there correct correct did rich have a few drinks too i didn't he could have had water diet coke yeah everybody was just standing on having a drink after meeting them were thirsty so you see how much of a battle is being done over that meeting. January 2nd, 1990 was a partnership entered into by the members of the Black Crows and Kevin Jennings. The Black Crows have gone on to have tremendous success. Their first album selling perhaps as many as five million copies. An interesting case. Our guest commentator tonight, Anna David Krasenik, joins us once again. He's been with us before on the, on the Joan Collins case in particular. Uh, a partner in a firm here in New York specializing in copyright and intellectual property entertainment law issues and has been practicing for 17 years. It's good to see you again, Doug. <laughs> good to see you again. <laughs> this pie chart yes. is blown up very nicely in court there. Is it a contract? Well, I'm not, from looking at the, at the pretrial order submitted by the parties, you get a sense that the plaintiff at first may have wanted to play it as a contract. I don't think it really is. Why not? Um, 
basically a contract, and I'm sure this is true in Georgia as it is in most other states, a contract must identify first and foremost the subject matter of this agreement. And number two, it also must identify the respective obligations of the parties. Now this chart, diagram, whatever you want to call it, souvenir, if you follow the defense description of that thing, um, doesn't satisfy that from any standpoint. I think that the plaintiffs must have realized fairly early in this trial, if not earlier on in the case itself, that the better way to play this was simply as evidence that corroborated their account of an oral contract. Because a partnership does not have to be proven by a written document. What does prove a partnership? It can be proven in three ways. Of course, one, a written agreement. But two, it can be an oral agreement, or three, it can simply be construed from the implied from the conduct of the parties. And then a court will examine the different um, uh, things that went on between the parties. Was there a sharing of profits? Uh, was there a, an understanding that they basically were co-owners of a business? Partnership is defined as a um, association of two or more people. Uh, doing business for profit, sharing both profit and losses together. Um, there can be all kinds of variations on that, but that's the basic idea, and it can be proven very, very easily. But the consequences of a partnership, once proven, are very profound, and that's what's at stake here. This is an all-or-nothing case. And we'll talk about that choice before the jurors, all-or-nothing in this case, and it boils down to a question of credibility. When we come back, we'll hear from the defendants, the band themselves, Chris Robinson of the Black Crows, Rich Robinson and Steve Gorman, all on the witness stand, talking about their memories or lack of memory of the night of January 2nd, 1990. Still ahead on Primetime Justice, the contract dispute between Kevin Jennings and the Black Crows rock band takes a different spin as members of the band deny ever offering a partnership to Jennings. Was there any mention at that time about Kevin being a partner with the band? No, not at all. Did anybody say anything like that? No, never. Did anybody that evening at any time say, Kevin, we want you to have the same deal that you had with the Georgia Satellites? No. Did Rich say anything like that? No. Stay tuned to Primetime Justice. of Kevin Jennings versus the Black Crows rock band does come down in the end to credibility. Can the jurors believe either side you know, about the question, was there a deal made at Jennings' home on January 2nd, 1990? We now turn to the defense case. The defendants were called as part of the plaintiff's case, but we'll hear what they had to say in their own case. Chris Robinson, who is uh, in the Black Crows, one of the founders of the band, guitarist in that band and co-songwriter along with his brother, here testifies that he doesn't even remember the day that this deal was supposedly done. The so-called pie chart that the lawyers have been calling the pie chart here, uh, <coughs> do you have any recollection of uh, some meeting at Kevin Jennings' house where this was created? No, I don't. Uh, Kevin Jennings testified that there was a two and a half hour business meeting where you and the rest of the members sat around and uh, made a conscious decision to offer Kevin Jennings a partnership, a full one-sixth partnership in the Black Crows band. My question is this, did that happen? Do you remember anything like that? No. Uh, let me ask you, with respect to this, uh, this is plaintiff's exhibit number one. The original is up there, but we can refer to this right here. Uh, you've looked, since this lawsuit was filed, you've uh, seen this document, have you not? I've seen the souvenir many times since the lawsuit. Uh, when you first saw it attached to the lawsuit, did you know what it was? No, I didn't remember specifically, no. Let me ask you, right up here, 
Kevin Jennings has testified that this is your signature, Chris Robinson. Is that your signature? It doesn't look like my signature, no. Right up here in the right hand corner there's an X and I think uh, Johnny Cole testified that he saw you put an X on this document. Uh, can you tell me whether or not you have ever on any kind of a legal document ever use an X to represent your signature? No, I never have. Have you ever signed your name with just an X? Never. Have you ever intended to sign your name uh, or that an X be intended as your signature on anything? No, never. Do you have any recollection with respect to this document as to whether or not you intended for this X to represent your signature? No, I didn't, no. Well, I misspoke there. Chris Robinson is the lead singer of the band the Black Crows, and there he says on the witness stand first, he doesn't even remember this meeting where this chart was drawn up and this supposed agreement was entered into, and second, that, that he wouldn't have made his mark, and X is on the uh, chart next to his name. He says he didn't even sign it in the first place. Well, on cross-examination, the plaintiff's lawyer, Erwin Stoltz, challenges and probes just how much does uh, Chris Robinson not remember here? On direct examination, you said you had no recollection of the pie chart, did you not? That's right. And you said you never offered Kevin a partnership or that Kevin was never offered a partnership in the Black Crows. Is that correct? That's right. You said you didn't remember the meeting. How can you say whether or not Mr. Jennings was offered a partnership in the Black Crows if you don't remember the meeting? Those are two separate things. I don't remember the meeting because I, I don't remember a meeting. That was, that was regards of asking someone to be uh, the same what, what entity that, that we were, that we had been working for, that would be something I would remember. It would ha probably have more gravity to me than, than this. That was, but that wasn't my question. My question was, <clears throat> you said that you did not remember the meeting where this was brought up and discussed. And I refer to uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit Number 1. Uh, if you don't remember that meeting, how can you say what was or was not discussed at the meeting? Because what, what I just said is, that would have been a discussion that I would have remembered. I mean, sans the meeting or not. The fact is, Mr. Robinson. So, I'm, so what I mean is, I'm not putting, I, 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 I imagine something very important I would, I would remember, you know? You remember this meeting, Mr. Robinson, in the interrogatories that you first signed. Interrogatory number three states, identify all persons who, to your knowledge, were present when the original of Exhibit A attached to the plaintiff's complaint was signed by you or any other, or any other person or alleged to have been signed by you on or about January 2nd, 1990. And your response was? This is number three? Yeah. <clears throat> Christopher M. Robinson, Richard S. Robinson, Stephen A. Gorman, Jeffrey P. Cease, and Charles H. Brandt, Kevin Jennings. Okay. Now, when you swore to the answers to the interrogatories, said that those people were present and the only way you could know that they were present was be for you to remember the meeting. Was that not true? No, I don't believe so. Okay. So plaintiff's lawyer Erwin Stoltz there trying to skewer the defendant, uh, Rich Robinson, on whether or not he actually does remember when this pie chart was drawn up. And David Krasenik, that raises a question. The very term pie chart, you think, is, is 
playing a role here. Yeah, well, I think it's rhetorically powerful. <clears throat> and it's a great phrase for the plaintiff. And it's something that all, it appears that all, the defense has almost had to accept on a defensive level uh, this term. Think of how it operates. You have this picture. It's a circle divided in six parts, but it doesn't tell you what's broken up into six parts. A pie chart imports some added force. It suggests that it is a division of proceeds. The word, I think, is very powerful and gives it more dynamite and more energy than the chart itself. And I, I think you see in other cases similar kinds of phrases that are designed to almost to have that kind of rhetorical power. In the Collins case, certainly the phrase quality versus quantity as to her manuscript. Very effective phrase in terms of pushing out the gray tones and pushing out the parts of their case that they don't really, that are problematic. And shaping the decision for the jury. Now, I, I misspoke once again. That was Chris Robinson there, and he described it as a souvenir, right. kind of trashing it. Well, my reaction when I first heard uh, Jennings put in his case, I was surprised because, frankly, you look at the pretrial materials, it's an uphill battle. It looks, it looks that way. When I saw him put in that prima facie case, assert his contract that he said existed, and then carefully crafted it around this document, this memorandum of the event, I don't even want to call it a memorandum quite, um, it really struck me now that the defense had something that they had to undo and really had to land a heavy punch to get out from under that. Um, whether that's happened yet, it's, it's, it's unclear. But to talk of it as a souvenir and to take it too lightly, I think raises a real problem for them because if they fumble on their explanation of that chart, it's a problem. Could backfire treating it as uh, it was done there. When we come back, we'll hear more of the testimony in this case. Kevin Jennings against the Black Crows. Did you ever refer to Kevin as our manager or, or our uh, manager of the day or something like that? No, I, I never did. I, I don't know if anyone else did, but I never did. With more of the testimony in this case, from the defendants from the Black Crows rock band. A defendant Rich Robinson, also a founding member of the band, on the witness stand here talking about what he and his fellow band members always thought about Kevin Jennings's role. He was never, he contends, the band's manager. Did Kevin Jennings offer any opinion or comments with respect to uh, your feeling that you wanted to hire Pete Angels as a uh, professional manager? He offered opinions on basically everything. I mean, he, you know, as, as did all of our friends, they would always say, hey, I think this, I think that, whatever. Um, I remember specifically, he would always want to throw his, quote, throw his hat in the ring. He always said, let me throw my hat in the ring. And, well, what did and you understand he was meaning by that? That means he wanted to manage us. Um, was Kevin Jennings ever the manager of the Black Crows Band? No. Uh, did he ever refer to himself uh, in your presence as the manager of the band? Not that I remember when I was around. Um, did you ever refer to Kevin as our manager or, or our uh, manager of the day or something like that? No, I, I never did. I, I don't know if anyone else did, but I never did. If someone had referred to Kevin at a, at a particular gig, when Kevin was picking up the money at the end of the show, mm -hmm. uh, if someone had referred to Kevin as the, the manager of the band uh, in the fall of 1989, would any, anyone have had any objection to that? No, I mean, basically, whoever collects the money you know, has to be kind of respectable, I suppose, and having a title like manager would make him sound cool or respectable, and so I'm the manager. I mean, you don't, you don't want to go up and say, you know, I'm the guy who gets the money, you know. You want to be, you know, you want to seem like you know what you're doing, at least, even if you don't. What was the band's response to Kevin Jennings' repeated suggestions to the band that he wanted to throw his hat in the ring uh, for management of the band? What, what was the band's response? Yes. Um, no. I mean, we, you know, after speaking with George, and, you know, George, all, you know, always, we followed George because he, 
always came through with his word. Um, you know, he said, you know, I, I love you guys. I mean, he told us that from the beginning. And he would always say things like, you know, um, this is what I think. And, and, and we always trusted him. And George specifically said, I think you guys need professional management if you guys want to have a, a go at it or, or even have a chance. Um, and so that, you know, that's what we wanted, a professional manager who had done it before, who had the contacts, who had worked, you know, who, who you could, we as a band could tangibly see has taken a band and gone here or, you know, become successful or whatever, whatever, you know, you want to say. And, and, and through that, having connections in the music industry um, because of that is also going to help. And that's what we specifically wanted. Well, one of the questions in this case that Kevin Jennings has brought is not only did he actually, he and the Black Crows, form a partnership, but was it dissolved? Did Kevin Jennings quit? The band and Kevin Jennings went their separate ways for a variety of reasons, and one day Kevin Jennings showed up and said, I'd like $5,000 for what I've done. He was given $300. Does that mean he settled? On cross-examination, plaintiff's lawyer Erwin Stoltz raises with band member Rich Robinson that issue. Now, with regard to the conversation, I believe it was at the center stage in December of 1990 with Kevin, the $300 conversation. That was at, that rehearsed too much in January of 91. Thank you. Recall the testimony. You said that Kevin had asked for five thousand dollars. Is that correct? Yes. And you said that uh, all you had in your bank account was three hundred dollars, and you gave him this check. Yes. Now, on this check, is there anything on that check that says payment in full? Uh, no. Does it? Anywhere on that check does it say uh, satisfaction and accord? No. In fact, purpose is left blank, is it not? Uh -huh. Every check I write, I leave the, the purpose blank. I'm just going to publish this check to the jury, if you don't mind, uh, please. So plaintiff's lawyer Owen Stoltz trying to get the jury to focus on the fact that there was no purpose written on that $300 check, and therefore it doesn't represent a winding up of the partnership. But David Korsnick, that then raises the question, if this was a partnership, as the plaintiff claims, entered into so informally as a handshake, mightn't it have been dissolved so informally as a check? Good point. Um, it could be raised that way, appear that way, but frankly, I'm not sure that this is a really powerful argument for the defense. They're trying to um, cast it in that light. The uh, difficulty that they have is that any payment to the plaintiff out of proceeds or profits or anything of that sort, there's a presumption that it, that, that it is an indication of a partnership. It's one factor that's to be considered. So they really need to explain those payments away. They need to say, well, it was repayment for a debt, reimbursement or something else. Uh, but that's what I think is really going on there. I don't think that a jury is going to really think that he withdrew for $300. So once again, we return to the central question, was there a deal in the first place? And when David, if I can ask you about a little bit of his testimony earlier, and that's his explanation. He's the one who drew up this so-called pie chart, and he said he was doing it to try to reassure the plaintiff. Uh, what do you make of that version? Well, it's interesting. He has to explain it. Someone's got to explain how that thing came into existence. I'm not sure he did a perfect job, as he needs to here, but again, the jury will tell us what, what, uh, how well he did. But it's interesting what happened here. You've got, at this moment, we know that Angelus and Whitley have now stepped in. They're the new personal managers who the band, whom the band have reached out toward. 
they look like they're moving towards some possible success, so the record hasn't taken off yet. And this is a typical moment, typical juncture in the history of a, grow, of a young band growing to success. There's a point where the big people step in, and the people who help make the band at the outset, who are undocumented, who don't have agreements to protect them, wind up being sort of pushed aside. So surely, at this moment, Jennings must have gone to these people and said, listen, I see you bringing in a new personal manager. Where do I stand? What's going to happen to me? Am I still here? And they probably said, oh, well, don't worry. You're still with us. You know, we're still friends. You've helped us. We're, don't worry. When the ship comes in, everyone's going to be happy. Now, that witness didn't do as well at the end in terms of the way in which he dealt with that clearly important human moment. He just says, I just wanted to go see the happy people. I didn't want to deal with that. And that's got to affect the jurors a little bit, even though, uh, as I think we both agree, the plaintiff still has to show that there was an agreement here and a meeting of the minds and so on. It was, it was perhaps an uncomfortable moment. You mentioned the culture here, and it, it struck me that maybe in this case we're looking at how rock music, when it's made first, is kind of a folk music, almost, informal at the local level, and then bam. It's a multi-million dollar business. Well, it's interesting. It, it's sort of the success comes quickly here, and it comes in a way that the parties themselves don't anticipate. It's interesting. This group had a record deal before this guy, Jennings, came into the picture. It was with Deaf American, an independent at that point. Um, they probably hit because of MTV or something like that, because this meeting takes place around the time of the release. So it's not a big record yet. But suddenly, success hits, and those people who are standing at the peripheries, like Jennings, without documentation, get hurt. All right. David, it's been a pleasure having you with us again on this case. We'll see you soon. Glad to be here, and thank you. Well, stay tuned for Instant Justice up next. Thanks for watching tonight. Good night.